Madison, Wisconsin, the capital city of ultimate. There's no doubt the crowd and energy and that momentum is contagious when you're on the road. Right? We have a little bit of an experience here, and we've taken care of this team a couple Reading of times in the oh, past. Skying through the contact for the score. Like it was nothing. It was awesome. Oh, my God. Be a gigantic moment for Madison. Minnesota and Madison have met 31 times in the Ultimate Frisbee Association, but tonight is the first time they square off in the Super Series. Welcome to the Power Up pregame show as we get you set for the Radicals and the Windchill, chapter number 32. Inside the broadcast booth at iconic Bree Stevens Field with former Radicals champion Colin Camp and Ian Toner. I'm Evan Leffler. And guys, it has been a crazy day here in the capital city of Ultimate. College Nationals created such anticipation and the momentum kind of sizzled as the day went along. Many lightning delays. I don't know if the Radicals are to be held responsible because of the logo being the lightning bolt, but the, the visionaries behind the logo, Colin, it's been a wild day, but th this should be a really interesting game tonight. The Radicals are 2-0. and They're still looking to be tested, obviously. The Windchill coming off a really disappointing loss, but the reigning champs in the division. And it, it feels like th there's kind of a weird importance riding on tonight's game. Yeah, absolutely. I, I always like to say that these early season games have high importance. You're going through some weird roster moments. You have some college guys still playing at Nationals. Yet every game matters because ultimately you want that home field advantage when you get to playoff time. And these are the types of games when it comes down to the tiebreakers that make the difference. And this is why at the professional level, the tryout process matters. You've got a roster of 40 people deep because you know you may not have your ideal prime top 20 in these phases of the season and you're going to have to find a way to grit out and gut out interdivisional wins so that you're in a better position later in the season a week ago at this time we thought this would be a battle between two undefeated teams minnesota certainly thought that as well but they did not give the proper respect to their opponent last week it was minnesota's home opener against a team that they had already crushed on the road Pittsburgh came to play, Minnesota did not, and in this league, that can bite you pretty fast. Absolutely, and obviously the wind played a big factor in that game, and I, I agree, I think they took the foot off the gas a bit after really you know, being in control that entire first game of the season against Pittsburgh at their home, home stadium, and so coming back to Seafoam for Minnesota, it was a struggle for them. You could tell that they haven't had that type of practice in the wind yet, and it really showed. Ian, I know you were studying deeply the film of the Radicals mechanics game last weekend. A 27 to 10 win as uh, Madison handed Detroit their 77th consecutive loss. Now the mechanics had a lead in the first quarter tonight at Pittsburgh, so we'll see what happens. But T Tim DeBile has led this Radicals program since the beginning. He's steady and he's trying to build them back up to the championship level that they were at six years ago. And I think he's as bullish as he's been in several years about where this program is. Talking to him in the lead up this week, he talked about how, hey, I don't want to use the term rebuilding, but last year with injuries and transition, maybe this program didn't perform where it wanted to and it couldn't find the cohesion that it wanted to. But now with a guy like Brian Hart more fully available and healthy in the lineup and having injury problems figured out, with Kai, Mar Kai Marcus back from injury, with other younger second-year players stepping up into bigger roles, he feels like this group is in a position to kind of reassert itself atop the Central Division. Quinn Snyder back in the lineup tonight for Minnesota. They missed him last week, but uh, he's an important goal scorer. As we look at the history of this series, Madison 19-12 and 12 all time. Of course, their first win uh, for Minnesota was back in 2014, but in recent years, the, 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 the rivalry has kind of shifted. Minnesota has you know, taken some of the prestige in recent seasons and that's something the radicals are trying to change tonight absolutely this rivalry used to feel like a big brother little brother type situation but little brother has certainly grown up 
in the last couple of years. And, and Minnesota, I think in a lot of ways, has modeled what Madison did throughout the years with their success and tried to implement that not with not only within their culture, but also their game plans. And it showed. I mean, last year they were one really kind of miracle play away from being in the in the UFA championship game. Madison had won 46 straight games against divisional opponents here at Breeze until Minnesota got the best of them in 2019. And that first game after the pandemic, the crazy hand block near the buzzer. Madison got a win here two years ago. But look, the Windchill went 3-0 against the Radicals last year, winning twice here. Minnesota obviously coming off a trip to championship weekend where they had a lead in the semifinals with the time ticking away. But we know what happened with Joel Clutton magic tip to the end zone and even in overtime a couple missed opportunities for the wind chill ben feldman said something interesting to me leading up to the season he said it's hard to try to sell your team that we're trying to win a championship when you never even have been to the final four previously now that they've gotten to the final four what's the next step for the chill i think this is a group that needs to understand how to play with a target on its back and it needs to know how to do that when it has all kinds of different personnel available you need that, I hate to sound too trite, but next man up mentality. And you need to have that trust and buy-in up and down the entire roster to say, I don't care who's active this week. We know what our identity is. We know what role we're stepping into. And we're going to be able to fill the shoes for the next guy. Colin, after their loss last week, do you still look at Minnesota as the favorite this year to win the Central? Or did that lost at home change your perspective i think going into this game tonight they are still the favorite but the outcome of this game will make a big difference in that outset and and for me if madison's able to pull off this win all of a sudden that really shifts the narrative in the central division wins are wins even if they're ugly and so i like to see what this minnesota windshield team's going to look like on a bounce back because that will really tell me what their championship pedigree is and really what kind of trajectory they have for the rest of the season Bivon closing in on 200 career goals. He's had a tremendous career, and we've seen him play O. We've seen him play D. Minnesota has a bunch of guys like that that can bounce back and forth. In fact, Ben Feldman whispered in my ear, Tristan Vanny Mortel going to play D tonight, trying to add to their conversion percentage, perhaps defensively. That With Josh Klain back in the lineup, they feel like they have the ability to make that swap. I mean, if you've got that luxury of getting a handler of Klain's caliber in your back pocket, I don't see why you don't make that move. Another thing that's really great to me about Brian Vinoka's season so far is he has yet to throw a turnover. I feel like that's always been one of the small criticisms you have about his game is his ability to value the disc. And you look at his stats, the only turnover that's associated with him is a drop on someone that he was trying to connect with. So if he can keep that up or at least keep clipping along at that place, that's going to set a great example for the rest of the offense. And given the volume of touches, it's just going to mean good things for the rest of the team. Colin, what's Andrew Meshnick like as a teammate? Great teammate. I mean, obviously he is soft-spoken, but he really lets his game do the talking. And he is probably the best player in this entire league at finding that play that will spark a big run. You see the 191 career blocks for him. He finds more ways to do he finds ways to do more with less athleticism than anybody else I've ever seen in my life, and that fires up your team. It really does, and he sparks the big runs for the Radicals. It doesn't sound like a compliment, but I think you mean it as a it compliment. It is, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at those numbers. He's third all-time in the league in blocks. He's third all-time in games played, and he's closing in on 3,000 career points played. Uh, an original member of the Radicals. Uh, we're about to wrap up the Power Up pregame show, and uh, you guys got, got to do a little taste test for me real quick. Okay, all right. Um, we got the uh, apple cinnamon. Uh, hold this for me. This is the pre-power. Th th this is good stuff, and I can't open it. Do we need Do we need to tap somebody else in? Yeah, do we need we, to bring in the relief we pitcher? Might. They, they, they secure this. Okay. It stays fresh. It does. All right. Colin, show me. He's going to just rip it open. This is going to be great. They're about to do the anthem here. We're going to try some trail mix. <laughs> We're going to take a quick timeout. And then when we come back, the opening pull. As we get you set for UFA Super Series, we got it open. How about that?
Beautiful night, we hope, at Free Stevens Field. Wind chill, radicals, coming up. With the entire Frisbee spotlight shining on the capital city of Ultimate, the undefeated Madison Radicals are focused on tonight's tough test. As the Minnesota wind chill invade Bree Stevens Field, looking to bounce back from last week's stunner against Pittsburgh. It's a Central Division showdown in the next chapter of the UFA Super Series. Minnesota at Madison, coming up next. Well, it's been a stormy Friday here in the capital city of Ultimate, but so far this evening, the skies have given us a window and we've got UFA Super Series coming at you with the Minnesota wind chill two and one after their surprising home loss last Saturday against Pittsburgh, taking on the two and zero undefeated Madison Radicals from the iconic Ultimate Haven, Breeze Stevens Field, just off the square. Good evening, everybody. Evan Leffler with Ian Toner and Colin Camp. Adam Ruffner will join us from the sideline as a, in a little bit as well. And look, this game was going to be big no matter what. The border war, Minnesota-Madison, the 32nd meeting, we know all that. After Minnesota's loss last week, it feels that much bigger. This is a time when we're going to have to figure out what Minnesota is made of. Is this a team that can play with a target on its back? Is this a team that can respond to adversity? And at the same time, is Madison ready to step up and reassert itself in this central division? And Colin, the Radicals are also trying to figure out exactly who they are. They think they're good, but the question is how good are they? We might find that out tonight too. Exactly. They've been trying to find that secret sauce since winning in 2018. They haven't returned to the playoffs since then. However, Tim DeBile is more bullish on this team than he has been in recent years with the additions of guys like Kai Marcus coming back from injury, as well as Gabe Bordick stepping up seemingly out of nowhere for that offense. Well, we saw Brian Vanoka moments ago. He, he's kind of a do-everything guy for this Minnesota team. They can put him on O, they can put him on D. He makes plays either way. Well, Brian is also having a career best year from a completion percentage perspective. That's always been the one challenge in his game. We know he can make the athletic plays. Can he value the disc? He's doing it better than ever this season. And on the other side, the Radicals offense has been completely transformed by a healthy Kai Marcus. Colin, he's really a, a thrower unlike the Radicals have ever had. Exactly, yeah. In, in an offense that's been predicated with small ball and short throws with guys like Andrew Brown, Tom Annan, Kai Marcus brings a whole new dimension to this team. He can rip it 90 yards, but then he can also swing it 30 yards across the field. He has every throw in the playbook, and he's going to be using them all tonight. I know that both these coaching staffs love to tinker, love to strategize. There's great respect between these organizations, but there's also fierce competition. And one of the things I was contemplating as we got ready for this evening's broadcast was just, I mean, who is this a bigger game for? I know Minnesota lost last week. But Minnesota has had Madison's number. I mean, they beat them three times last year. They won three of the last four here at Breeze, a place where nobody in this division used to come and win. So I think you could make an argument that for Madison tonight is, is really a, a, a turning point in their season one way or another. Can they protect their home turf against a team that won this division a year ago? Absolutely, yeah. I would say this is their, their test to see if they're legitimate this year. From my perspective, the formula is always hold at home with the wins and try to win half of your road games. This is a crucial win for them tonight if they want to find that path back to the playoffs and also if they want to get home field advantage, something that has been a major benefit in them making championship weekends in the past. And even when the weather has not cooperated most of the day, at time for the opening pull, these stands still have plenty of fans. We were having a, an early dinner next door. We saw a bunch of folks in Radicals gear. There, there's a whole vibe to this neighborhood on a Madison Radicals game day. Well, Colin, you used to live right next door, too, so you could speak to this better than anyone else. But having been lucky enough to travel around to so many great communities around our association, Madison really is something special on game day. Absolutely. Go ahead, Colin. I was just going to say, absolutely, this, this community has gotten behind this team, and they're excited for this season opener tonight against a division rival. We are underway. Super Series Free Friday Frisbee from Madison, Wisconsin. Radicals beginning on O. Anthony Gutowski 
Gives it off to Victor Luo. One of the big changes for the Radicals this year is Marcus's emergence has allowed Luo to push downfield, and that's where they feel he's the most effective. Brian Hart going deep, and it's knocked out of his hands at the very last second. Brent Bergmeyer apparently going to be credited with a clean block. Well, Bergmeyer, the heads-up defense there. He was the help defender, wasn't initially assigned to the Hart assignment and peeled off and able to make the play quickly in that deep space. So a break chance for Minnesota on the first point of the night. Kristen Vandy Mortel, as we mentioned the power up pregame show, is out there on defense. There's some contact between Bergmeyer and Gutowski, and it's going Minnesota's way. And this is a good early test for this mass and radicals offensive line. I don't really see that they have been tested too much early on in the season. And so trying to get this first hold of the game will be crucial for them for this momentum. Colin will see if your old college teammate Ben Feldman decides to take an early timeout. He's put a lot of trust into this defense. Dylan DeClerc with a nice sliding snag. Tanner Barkus near the sideline to Bergmeyer. Madison defensively trying to bear down. And is that a stall or a timeout? It's a stall! Minnesota stoned on the goal line. Surprise, Feldman did not pull the trigger on the timeout quickly enough there to maintain possession. Same here, but also credit to this Madison offensive unit able to lock down in the red zone when it mattered most. We've seen red zone conversion be a challenge for other teams around the league in the opening weeks of the season. Even great offenses like New York and Salt Lake struggling to find their footing. Veteran radical Pat Shrywise directing traffic, and DeClerc wants a pick. He's going to get it. And the stall count was at five or six. I saw the official chopping his arms. A pick card against Madison. Steve Haynes, Craig Howard, Hank Carey, Jonathan Monforti, the officials tonight. So Trywise going to take a timeout. Radicals recognizing the stall count was high. So it's the O-line taking a timeout in the opening point, something you don't see very often. Happy birthday, Kevin Pettit Scantling, KPS turning 33 today. And there's Tim DeBile. He's been the coach of this franchise since the very beginning, back in 2013. Had a lot of success against Minnesota through the years, although not so much the past couple years to take you through the odyssey that has been this opening point. Well, I really like that wrinkle early on, sending Brian Hart deep. Get, so far this season, the Madison Handlers have been the key to their offense, and they've been doing a lot of small ball. It was fun to see them really stretch the field early on. I'd like to see that happen more, sending Vic deep as well, and seeing what kind of you know opportunities they can produce out of the Handlers shooting deep. Looks like most of the same personnel on the field for about Madison. To, about to say the same thing. Surprised to not see... Too many other spells. Look, if you're not familiar with Kai Marcus, he was a gunslinger playing for North Carolina kind of before their real dynastic run of championships. He was a, a member of that school's program when they were good. But his emergence as a thrower for the UFA's Madison squad has changed the dynamic. And after the timeout, the Radicals Work it to Vic Luo into the end zone, and it's one nothing rad Radicals. So Madison calls that timeout. They've got a high stall count that they've got to deal with. And what do they do? They draw up a zipper play. The first two guys clear out off the front of the stack, making room for that third person in the stack, Victor Luo, to come under, get an easy continuation. It's not the most revolutionary play call in the world, but it worked right there. Exactly, and that's, that's the key part of having Kai Marcus being added into this offense. It gives Victor Luo the opportunity to go downfield, use his athleticism to get open in those high stall situations, and it's going to unlock the Madison offense this year as long as they are all able to stick together on that line and stay healthy. So 
So this wind chill O-line has been waiting for a little bit to get a chance to play. Josh Klain back in the lineup today. Gordon Larson making his second appearance of the season for the Winchill in a Division III College National Championship last week. Josh Klain likes to huck into double coverage, batted up in the air, and to the turf it falls. Precariously hung up there, but Joe Leapforth got the block. Well, a risky move going for an upline block on Josh Klain and not getting it because you leave him in power position with absolutely no mark. That's usually a recipe for disaster, but on that instance, Klain hanging it just a tiny bit too much. Phenomenal defense there by Madison, too. So Minnesota worked it about 75 yards down the field but could not punch it in. Now it's Madison's turn to work this direction, looking for the break. Almost five minutes off the clock already. Mitchell McCarthy shoots it. Just shy of the goal line, Luke Marks. Cross field hammer. Bookends for Joe Liebforth. Two nothing, Radicals. And had Madison not called that timeout on the first play of the game, I think they would have called a timeout there. But boys, Coach DeBile happy that he did not. Great throw by Luke Marks, throwing the right-handed hammer despite being a lefty. Fun little twist there. Here's a deep pull for the real hardcore ultimate nerds. Shades of Joe White in the college semis at 2017 just having the disc on the goal line and uncorking a cross field hammer as a young contributor on the team. A lot of stones on that throw. Absolutely. Joe White, of course, hoping to stifle the championship weekend aspirations of both of these programs. We'll see about his availability with the union throughout the rest of this season. And high profile signing, but if he doesn't take the field, it doesn't matter much. So it's the Minnesota D-line playing offense here. Veteran Brandon Mattis with a lofted swing hauled in by Dylan DeClerc. Danny Mortel keeps it moving. Christian Johnson, back from Minnesota this year. He didn't play in 22 or 23, but he's one of a couple returning Minnesota players. Greg Cousins also back after a long half-decade-plus hiatus. Danny Mortel bluffs the hammer. Mattis was, KJ. Mattis was moving downfield. The clerk is open deep. And Minnesota is on the board. And today, Minnesota is really going to be relying on some of those veterans like Madison to clerk to carry this team. Having a guy like Sam Bergman out, not having a few of your college players back yet, like Ian McCoskey and Paul Krennic, huge pieces of that D-line. It's going to be critical for them to come back and serve that role. Obviously, there they they serve an offensive role, but as you're going to see this game progress, look for those veterans to really step up on their D-line and play big points if, if Minnesota wants to have a chance in this game. What a point there for Brandon Mattis. Got a couple swings off the sideline. You typically think of him as that, st as that stalwart defender, but he's fitting in well when his team needs him to play offense. He was also getting plenty of separation. You saw that one hammer bluff. I think it would have been completed if the throw had gone up. And then as he's walking off the field, he doesn't even bother to look the final throw in. He just knows that that's going to be a score no matter what. Supreme confidence there from the veteran. Hi, Marcus throws into a very tight window, breaking through the double team. Swings it for Shrywise. Both teams trying to settle in, find a flow offensively. High stall, shot to the back of the end zone, and it works! <laughs> D. 
Gabe Vordick has been an unreal revelation to this Radicals team. 23 years old, out of Northeastern. He showed up to tryouts. Tim DeBow didn't know who he was. He has been an unbelievable impact player for the Radicals O-line. Coming and, off a five-goal game last week. And just like Anthony Gutowski was that catalyst last year for their offense, Gabe Vordek's filling that role now and really allowing Gutowski to play more of a hybrid role, which is, again, feeding into the reason why Tim DeBio is so bullish on this team. Guys like Gabe Vordek coming seemingly out of nowhere and being able to play a crucial role early on, stepping up in the biggest game of the year so far. Madison earning road wins at Pittsburgh and Detroit, but you're absolutely right, Colin. There's different feel to this one tonight. The reigning Central Division champs, team that swept Madison 3-0 last year. In the preseason this year, these two teams met halfway in between the Twin Cities and here in Madison for a preseason exhibition scrimmage. Minnesota won, but both coaches had good things to say about the other team. Thought the regular season games would be very competitive this year. Leo Savell Fernandez, talented youngster out of Middlebury. Gets it back from Snyder. Kelson Alexander on the mark. Michael Jordan over to Josh Klain and back to Savell Fernandez. The font on Leo's back is much smaller than everybody else's on his team. He'll squeeze in all those extra letters. Jordan keeps it moving for Larson. And just beyond the goal line was Josh Plain. I mean, how devastating has that deep upline cut and then skinny, shallow turnaround? How devastating has that become, especially in pro in the last, I don't know, five plus years? There's so much responsibility that that upline defender has. There's so much space when they're attacking the upline space. And you don't necessarily have a help defender always in the area to help on that shallow inside lane to be a little bit of a threat. So it's just such an easy option for throwers who can get that inside throw off. Exactly, and in Minneapolis Ultimate, that's been a staple for years now. Josh Klain can do that cut in his sleep. He's probably run that cut 5,000 times in his life, or, you know, 10,000 to be to be a, perfect, a perfectionist at it, right? He's, he's gotten his 10,000 hours. Cam Lacey lets rip another pull. No Sam Berglund tonight for Minnesota, but when Berglund's not in the lineup, Lacey is also an excellent puller and an impact defender for this Minnesota team. Luo begins the point downfield, now comes under and by himself in the backfield. Gutowski oh, somehow squeezes it through. You can really feel the Minnesota defensive energy from here in the booth. They're playing hard. They're very close to a couple blocks already on this point. Floater brought down by Jack Nelson. No one really open, so he just flings it to nobody. That's a coverage sack, folks. And this is the type of defense that Minnesota played last year that allowed them to get the championship weekend, this high-octane, high-energy defense. And then on the turn, they run you into the ground. Let's see if that's what they present right now. This could be a Callahan, and it will be! Anthony Gutowski, Callahan! And boy, has that gotten the crowd into this game. The fans are out tonight despite the weather, and boy, did Gutowski give them something to cheer about there. The Callahan count continues to rise. Excellent handler defense from the second year pro. And the guy they call Gumby secures the defensive score. It's just so tough for a D-line offense when your last reset cut is coming off the front of the stack or coming off that downfield space. There's so much time for the defender, even if they're trailing by a step or two, 
that defender can just sell out and completely commit to going in that straight line space to the backfield. And there's a different dynamic in that position for defenders that helps them make up ground as opposed to another cut where there are more options for the receiver. Second Callahan of the season for the Radicals. Jake Carrico had one in the Pittsburgh game a couple weeks ago. Vinoka for Klain. One thing we should note, Matt Rader expected to be in the lineup for Minnesota tonight, but he had travel issues on the way here. Tons of storms throughout the Midwest. He's on his way. They expected him to get here a little bit after the start of the game. We'll see how quickly he can make an impact at his cleats on, warm up. Certainly a, a, a big cog to be missing as Barry shoots it for Larson. Colin Barry in his season debut shows what he can do. And that's certainly a welcome sight for Minnesota getting Colin back, Barry back on the field. I know earlier this season he was dealing with a hamstring issue and then later on with, with a flu-like symptoms to, to miss a game as well. So he's really one of those vets that we were talking about earlier that needs to step up in this game in order to allow the windshield to really stay competitive with some of the losses that they have tonight. There's a turnover in the backfield, but we've got a whistle. Brian Hart, nice to see him back on the field for the Radicals. Luo, nice vision. Marcus floats it. To the end zone. Avery Johnson with a score. And Madison leads by two, just over a minute to play in the opening quarter. And for those that don't understand that celebration, last year Avery Johnson actually broke his arm laying out in that same corner on that same type of play. So I think he's trying to tell everybody his arm's intact this time. What a moment there for Johnson, and what spacing there from the Radicals offense. Just not on top of each other, allowing those continuation throws to open space, not clogging on one side of the field. When you put those defenders on islands, it's just so difficult for them to deal with. And credit to Trywise for architecting with Tim DeBile what that offense was going to look like on that point. First assist of the night for Kai Marcus, his fifth of the year. Marcus did not play in Detroit last week. He had four assists in the opening win at Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, by the way, was down a couple early against Detroit. They bounced back and were up three at the half. Nice work there by Sterling Kanaki in the lane. He made Minnesota make multiple moves to try and get open and made Minnesota think just a little bit longer about that underneath throw leading to the turnover. Radicals got a break on the second point of the game. Led 2-0. This would be the first break for either side since. Leap fourth for Kelson Alexander. Ten seconds left here. Is Tim DeBile going to burn one? I'd be surprised if he does. Alexander called for a stall. That's, that's a tough outcome there. So that stops the clock. Three and a half seconds. Minnesota's going to have a chance to shoot it from midfield to the end zone. This is a time where they wish they had Matt Rader on the field. Colin Berry, Quinn Snyder, big targets as Klain rips it deep. Final throw of the quarter, and it's brought down by a tumbling Brian Vinoka. And the windchill are back within one. And, some, and those are some of the demons 
that Madison has really been trying to fight off over the last couple of years. The end of the quarter situations they have been absolutely devastated by. I know Tim DeBile has put in a ton of work along with Jacob Spiro to try to fix those issues. Right now, missing a guy like Max Sample, who's 6'8 and can be a, a real target back there for those Ds is, is playing a big part. I mean, that's just a gut-wrenching sequence there for Madison. Kanaki works so hard to kind of intimidate that turnover. They get the ball with a chance to make a break. They could extend their lead, and instead, they give up an end-of-quarter buzzer beater, and it's a one-goal game once again. Saw the looks of exasperation on the Radicals' faces. Madison up late Minnesota in the first quarter, but we got ourselves a one-goal game. Well, despite the thunderstorms really hurting this ultimate celebration that we've had today in the capital city, uh, we got a great crowd on hand and an exciting game through 12 minutes. Ben Feldman's wind chill getting a buzzer-beating grab from Brian Vanoka. He said he does a little bit of everything. Usually you don't think of him as a buzzer-beater, uh, conversion guy, but no Matt Raider, no problem. We got Bivon. So now Be Madison has to pull to start the second, and Minnesota has a chance to tie. Bivon's got hops for days, so he may be giving up a few inches, but once he gets a second to turn on those pogo sticks, he can get up there. Luke Marks will do the honors to begin quarter number two. Four goals, four assists, four Ds for Marks in the first two games of this year's radical season. Josh Klain from his own end zone, double teamed. Snyder to Larson and back to Klain. Much more breathing room now and a touch for MJ, Michael Jordan. Here's Bivon underneath, and he'll take the shot. Meshnik chasing Snyder in the end zone. Oh, goodness! Quinn Snyder to the top floor. Skies, Andrew Meshnik for the score. And what an absolute gem of a play by Quinn Snyder there. Andrew Meshnik is no slouch in terms of height. Watch this disc, floats perfectly on a shelf, and Prince Snyder goes up and absolutely roofs Andrew Meshnick. What a play. So Snyder took a red eye last night from Vancouver to Chicago, landed at 5 a.m. this morning, got a little bit of shut-eye at a hotel, worked remotely, took a bus from Chicago to get here for this game. And I'll tell you what, I can't even tell that he's done that because he is showing up here, ready to play, turning on the Jets, jumping out of the roof. That type of dedication is why he can jump like that. Not wrong, my friend. A, a lesson we all could perhaps learn. Not that we're going to try to embrace that schedule because it sounds exhausting. So the momentum here has swung, and this is a huge point for the Radicals offense. Colin, you've been an O-line player in situations like this. After a break, after a momentum play, how do you maintain your composure? Yeah, I mean, honestly, this is where you lean on your veteran players within the line. In years past, I, I always would try to step up. Guys like Peter Graffy would really try to level things out for us, and it's all about the next point. You can't worry about anything else. It's the next point. You've got to forget everything in the past. Noah Hansen massaging that calf. Hopefully he's okay. Takes a sub. And that's a turnover. Bobbled and dropped by Brian Hart on a rising throw from Luo. Winchill looking for their first lead. Lacey swings it. Ben Feldman has both of his timeouts. Will he use one on this possession? He's walking the sideline right near the official. And we get a whistle and a timeout is called. 96 seconds into this second quarter. And the wind chill about 30 something yards away from having their first lead tonight. A bunch of players who are in this game tonight have won gold medals in the past. 
A bunch of broadcasters in this game tonight have won gold medals as well. Look at this photo from 2013, the U23 national team. And in the middle there, you got Josh Klain. Josh Klain, Kelson Alexander, and Brian Hart, who are playing tonight. And there's Ian Toner and Colin Camp as well. 11 years ago, guys. Does it feel like that long? I, I can't believe you guys did this to me right now. I can't believe this. I know. I can't either. This makes me feel so old. My gosh. What do you remember most from that experience with those uh, with those teammates? If we're talking about the guys playing in this game, I just remember how much of a rock Brian Hart was. And that kid was playing through all kinds of pain and foot injury and difficulty. He never complained once to anybody. He was the central grounding force, keeping everyone calm and level for so many of us who hadn't necessarily, and I can't speak for Colin, competed on a stage like that before. Completely agree with Toner, yeah. It was one of those experiences where as a team we came together, it was good vibes the whole time, and it helped because we were winning throughout. Winning solves a lot of problems, doesn't it? Absolutely. You guys won the gold medal in Toronto, right? And we lived to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> but only one of my knees survived. Crossfield Hammer and Josh Klain puts Minnesota on top for the first time this evening. 6-5 chill. I know we got to talk about this game. I'm glad you're willing to be the one making the joke about that, Colin, because I, I felt so <laughs> bad for you dealing with the ACL tear there. But such a huge part of our offensive success at that tournament. And speaking of offensive success, how about this Minnesota squad valuing the break opportunity, getting the right personnel out there after the timeout? And the crossfield hammer converting. Yeah, this is exactly what Minnesota has shown over the last couple of years, building into this championship type level team. They get hit with a gut punch to start the game. They absorb that blow and they come back with, with a strong fight. That's not what the windshield were in the past. And Ben has done a great job of really shifting that mentality and creating a culture where they can shift that mentality. And we got some technical difficulties from the sideline. But and the Radicals are having some technical difficulties on the field as well. Getting word from our colleague Adam Ruffner that A, Matt Raider is here, and B, there's a little bit of rain starting to fall and get things a little slicker down there. So be interested to see what else Adam can observe on the sideline. Brett Birdmeyer. Matt Johnson, excuse me, Christian Johnson. And here's Mattis. Resets for Vanny Mortel. Before tonight, Vanny Mortel had played only one D point compared to 50 O points in the first few games. Minnesota switching him to defense tonight for situations like this. Although Ben Feldman wants to get the O-line on the field. Andy Mortel's like, I had everything under control. And yet, second time out of the corner. Madison was up 5-3 with the disc, looking to go up 6-3 when they got stalled out at midfield with three and a half seconds left in the quarter. And since then, it's a 3-0 run for the wind chill, including the buzzer beater. Yeah, and you never want to question Coach DeBio. He's had a lot of success throughout the years, but I think Toner was the last time we had a situation. We had three. Nelson Alexander had to be really uncomfortable. The time was really down. Yeah, and, and yeah, if they coach you to do it, I would really fucking think it was Essentially, guarantee yourself a five minute I know. All the momentum at that point. Hey, 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 the wind chill huddle there. Ben Feldman has raved about his group of assistant coaches. Is that is Carlos Lopez, who's a part of the USA national team staff for the mixed team that's headed to Australia. And uh, Kelsey Percy has been on the staff in the past. Max Longchamp has an incredible database of information that has been very significant to Minnesota's recent success. After the timeout, Winchill trying to convert. 
their second break. I'm impressed by Larson tonight. He's out there running hard. You can tell he's in championship shape. Savell Fernandez to the open, Vinoka bursting up the line for the score. Four straight for the wind chill. What an addition for Minnesota. Leo Savell Fernandez has those Minnesota roots. He's just never been able to be back in the community during the pro season. And Ben Feldman had said, hey, every spring, every summer, I send him a message, hey, any chance you're going to be back? Any chance you want to do this? And the stars have finally aligned here for his commitment to be on the level in this 2024 season. And you can see what he brings to the group as we take a look back at this buzzer beater at the end of the first quarter. That's when the momentum really shifted. That made it 5-4. The clean score made it 6-5. And now Vinoka just wanting this space more. And the Radicals sideline is silent right now. Windchill looking to keep it rolling. Said three points in a row now. It feels like a must score for Madison. Marcus sends it high in the air. Gutowski read it well and rips it down with a left hand. And we had talked about earlier how some of the play of Gabe Bordek had allowed Gutowski to play a bit more of a hybrid role. You can see Tim DeVille there leaning on Gutowski to come back in, grab a goal from them, something he did many times last year and has done so far this year as well. So you can see early on Tim DeVille, some of the things he maybe wanted to implement, some of the changes he wanted to put in with this, with this offense, he's kind of falling back on some of the more guaranteed type situations. Colin, there was a time if you lofted a throw the way Marcus just did, you, you'd find your butt on the bench, I think, the next point. But but Kai has a different level of permission to take those chances in the Madison offense. Absolutely. He has the full send green light, unlike anyone I've ever seen in this offense. Two assists for Kai. Gutowski with a couple of goals as well. Winchill with a one goal lead. Leo Savell Fernandez sending it over Luke Marks, but Marks takes care of it. What do we got? Officials blow the play dead. There was certainly contact after Marks pulled it down. I could see that being a foul on Minnesota. I can't imagine they call a foul on Marks. He was yeah, that's in position with every right to that disc. Completely agree with you. And that's almost a bit of an unlucky break for Madison if that's the case as they were off to the races there basically playing seven on six. Long talk here. Luke Marks has the Frisbee. Radicals with a chance to tie this thing up. It's not going to happen, at least on that possession. Plain quickly collects. Barry floats it over the target, back to the end zone. Incomplete. Always bound to have at least one of those crazy red zone sequences in a Minnesota Madison matchup. Wonder if we've actually just gotten it out of the way here in the second quarter, if it'll be the first of many. Second break chance to the point for the Radicals. Laying out near midfield, keeping possession alive. Mac Weber. Jake Carrico. On the barbecue backhand of Luke Marks. Weber keeps it moving. Carrico to the end zone. Piran Robert 
Scores the goal, and we're even again, seven up. I mean, this is just becoming a game of runs. 6-3, 7-7. Who can actually stake a claim to momentum and sustain it for any meaningful period of time in this game? Welcome to the Madison and Minnesota rivalry, <laughs> where chaos ensues at all times. <laughs> I like the way you describe that. What are these games like to play in anticipating and dealing with that chaos? Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things you expect the runs to happen, right? When, you are, when you're used to playing in this rivalry game, you know each other so well, it's actually almost surprising if you're up by six or seven because you just don't expect that to happen. But you know when you're up by six or seven, that can flip quickly. So Minnesota's D-line primarily out there after the O-line got broken. Cousins to Barkas, keeps it moving. Johnson to Vandy Mortel. Wide open Cousins, quick release, Bergmeier. And Mattis, able to finish that point off his 98th career score for the veteran Brandon Mattis who's been on the wind chill since the beginning. Earlier in this game, the personnel populating what on this point was an O-line but is traditionally a Minnesota D-line were struggling to get the disc off the sideline and they were falling victim to the opportunistic Madison double teams and lane poaches. On that possession, they didn't exactly bounce it off the line quickly, but they understood that they needed to go against the grain, not let Madison's double team set in. That hammer off the line so critical to changing the point of the attack breaking down the foundation of the defense and opening up that break side, so to speak, continuation for the goal. Well, in the lead up to this game too, we were talking to Coach Feldman and he talked about how Minnesota needed to get back to playing their type of ultimate. That is their type of ultimate, that patient offense, really utilizing their legs to open up their throws. And we're seeing that more and more throughout the points. I think the last four goals as well have been scored by their veterans, right? Bevon, Klain, and also uh, right there, Mattis. Well, those who are familiar with the story of the day here in Madison, Wisconsin, I think lightning has come too close to Bree Stevens Field. And unfortunately, that means we're gonna have a, a stoppage here with 5.16 to play in the second quarter. Minnesota by one and The Radicals ready to receive when we resume, but for the moment, uh, there, there's going to be at least a little bit of a delay. The, the, the evening forecast certainly looked better. We knew there was a, a tail on a, a, a weather system, but you know, the fact that the referees have not sprinted to shelter is probably a positive sign. But uh, man, what a game so far. What, what a day it has been. Con, I know you've had some crazy weather in this town over the course of the past week or so, but uh, what, what, is this normal? No, this isn't normal. I mean, it's, it's interesting because we've had such a pleasant spring. We've had so many days in the 70s and 80s where it was sunny and, and calm and low breeze, and now all of a sudden we are, we're looking at these rain showers and, and severe thunderstorms, really. Welcome back to our nice, cozy, dry broadcast booth. Colin, Ian, I'm Evan. Uh, it's been a wild start to the season around the league. If you think about it, you know, week one, you were in Salt Lake for the shred. They weren't perfect, but they certainly made an opening statement in week one. Then week two, we saw the New York Empire lose for the first time in almost three years. Those are just a, a, a couple of the fascinating storylines we've seen so far this season across the league. Well, even with that imperfect week one and perhaps a performance that wasn't up to their standards against San Diego, for my money, Salt Lake is the team to beat in the league right now, and they're the odds-on championship favorite. They play an offense that utilizes the width and depth of the field better than I think any other offense in the league right now. They have a bunch of young, springy, endurance-heavy athletes who can sustain that churn and that open-up space downfield all game long for each other. And I'm 
I'm trying to come up with a team in the back of my mind who can really challenge them. Carolina looks strong. Atlanta looks good. You never know how much continuity they're going to have on their roster from game to game. But Salt Lake is the class of the league right now. Well, I would say, honestly, that's a great point because once you get that championship taste in your mouth, that Final Four weekend taste in your mouth, you have something to fight for the next year. Like we were talking about earlier, Coach Feldman was having a really hard time convincing those windchill players that they were a championship team that needed to be their goal when they had never reached that, that point before. Salt Lake City was there last year. They had one heck of a play to make the championship game. Yeah. And they ran into a buzzsaw that was New York. Things are different in the league this year. There's been some key changes to, dip, to, to the rosters. And now Salt Lake City sees this opportunity on their home field to take advantage and win their first ever championship. Let's let's take a quick thought back at the championship weekend last year as, as the rain continues to pour down here at Bree Stevens Field. The Minnesota Windchill were seconds away from winning that semifinal and advancing to the championship game as We, we, we got to put the windows back in our booth because the uh, the wind is coming in. Let, let's uh, let's take it to a break. It's raining sideways, it's, folks. It is raining sideways here in Madison. And uh, I said we were cozy and dry in the booth, and Mother Nature said, take this. All right, Super Series. We're in a rain delay, and it is really coming down. Well, it's been that kind of a day here in Madison, Wisconsin. The skies have opened up numerous times. We have seen a bunch of lightning bolts. We need to update that graphic, folks. Light rain. If this is light rain, then I don't want to see normal rain because that would be more like biblical rain. Um, yeah, we're wet, but we're fine. Colin Camp, Ian Toner, Evan Lepler. There's such an anticipation for morning number one at college nationals you really can't describe it unless you're there if you're you guys have played in it i've just been there as a fan and a broadcaster but it was going to be such a special day and you know, we're not even through one round before the lightning arrives this morning We've had multiple stoppages and of course the ufa not immune from mother nature either what what, what a day it has been yeah absolutely and, and i was saying right before we got off the broadcast here it's been gorgeous here in madison really up until about a week ago. And so it's so unfortunate that this is the timing to see this type of weather because Madison loves ultimate and we love putting on ultimate events. So to not have the opportunity to do that with nationals, with the home opener, it's really disappointing for the community. You, you, you got to admire the dedication. Yeah. I mean, that are, individual. Are, are they preparing duo. for the amazing race or something? Like, what is what, what do we got going on here? Best they're, fans in the league. Yeah, okay. All right, they, that too. They're not that the too. only ones. We, we got a one-score game. Minnesota is leading 8-7, and it, it has not just been a, a linear path to 8-7. It has been windy back and forth. Minnesota had a chance to break on point number one, couldn't do it. Minnesota... Fell behind 2-0. They were down 5-3. Madison had the disc to go up 6-3 at the end of the first. And that's when everything kind of flipped because of a stall at midfield. If you're just joining us, here's how we got to this point. Early in the game, high stall shot. Gabe Bordick brings it down. And uh, Pat Trywise gets a nice assist, courtesy of the youngster out of Northeastern. This is one of those pieces that Tim DeBile has been looking to take on bigger responsibility. He didn't know that he was going to have that piece this season, but put himself on the map in tryouts, and we get a look at the Callahan here. Gutowski kind of filling the role that you used to play as an O-line goal scorer, Colin. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a role that Tim DeBio is always looking for. He wants guys that are willing and able to make those kill cuts, fill up the stat sheet, and really open up space for the team. Saw the buzzer beater, Bivon, Sky in the pack, and Brandon Mattis. Four and a goal. 516 to play in the second quarter. And we will step aside for the duration of this rain delay. Hopefully it won't be too long, so don't go too far. UFA Super Series currently with the pause button. Well, good evening once again from Bree Stevens Field here in Madison, Wisconsin. The rain is gradually subsiding, and we are about five minutes away 
from resuming this UFA Super Series showcase. The Minnesota Windchill and the Madison Radicals, a one goal game with five minutes and 16 seconds remaining in the second quarter. Had plenty of twists and turns in this game, in this day. And now we are getting set to resume play. There's gonna be a four minute halftime after the end of the second quarter. So we basically got two and a half quarters of ultimate gentlemen coming up. And an important result that this guy's gonna have something to say about. The, the weather might have been a blessing in disguise for Minnesota because it let Matt Rader, who arrived to the stadium right as the rain was starting to come down to get warmed up and try to contribute here down the stretch. Yeah, and Evan, we heard from Adam Ruffner, who's down on the field. He mentioned to us that Raider came in, looked in looking very locked in and loaded and ready to go. So Ruffner's expecting big things from this from this guy in the second half. I'm expecting big things from Raider as well. His size presents difficulties for that Madison defense. I expect him to be coming out guns a blazing. This is a guy who's turned in 10 score performances here at the pro level. He's won multiple times here in Bree Stevens Field against hostile crowds. It feels like kind of a, a cheat code power up that you're getting here in the middle of the second quarter for Minnesota. Like a big bite of power up trail mix perhaps. Um, no, we did not choreograph that folks. <laughs> Colin, this is such an unusual day, you know, across the sport from the disruptions at college nationals to now we, what we've had here tonight. In your playing career in the UFA, did you ever have a game that was stopped and started like this that you can remember? So I can't remember that we've ever had one that was stopped and started, but we did have about a two hour delay before we played Pittsburgh for a playoff game actually. And, and I remember sitting around and obviously the whole day you kind of build up that game in your mind and then you're, you're sitting there for two hours waiting, warming up, stop warming up, warming up, stop warming up. And so it is a mental test, right? I mean, all their bodies I think will be fine. I don't think that the weather really affects how they were feeling at this point. It's not a hot evening tonight. It's all a mental thing. So obviously Madison took on a big hit through that second quarter. Let's see if they can bounce back. Let's see if they got their mindset back into the right right space of really where they were in the beginning of this game, dominating. Hi Marcus, a couple assists. He looks really tense right now. Testing his gymnastic skills. Oh my goodness. Kai Marcus is uh, getting loose as we are just minutes away from resuming this game. It, it, it's been a, a wild day here in Madison, Wisconsin. The, the, the turning point was the Josh Klain to Brian Vanoka buzzer beater uh, at the end of the first quarter. That, that really changed the flow and the feel. Madison still had a one goal lead when that uh, buzzer beater was caught by Bivon, but the, the game certainly swung from there. That was, you think about the sequence of events there. Kelson Alexander and Madison with a chance to break and enlarge their lead. Tim DeBile, an opportunity to call a timeout. Easy for us to Monday morning quarterback up here. Less than 10 seconds remaining in the quarter. Unable to convert there. And, and the killer part is that that stall gave Klain the disc at midfield. A thrower of that caliber. An easier look than ever to make the disc to the end zone. We haven't talked a ton about the new professional ultimate frisbee that everyone's been using, but the range for someone like Klain is not even close to a, being a question at midfield, but even if he had gotten that disc, you know, deep in his own end zone, maybe he still could have made it there, but at least it would have been more challenging for him. So the team's huddling up, trying to bring the mojo. Difficult to do considering this game got underway a little over two hours ago. We have been delayed for a good hour and a half. And yet we are moments away from resuming. Madison's going to be on offense, trailing by one. Oh, in, a, in a close game, like we often see in this border battle between Minnesota and Madison. I mean, how many times tonight have I mentioned Radicals O-line taking the field? This really feels like a big point. I, I say it because it's true. I mean... And look, I don't trust this Radicals offense yet. They, they have been better this year. They've scored 25 goals a game in two games against Pittsburgh and Detroit. But the Radicals offense has been what has held them back during this string of seasons where they haven't been able to make the playoffs. And we've been sold 
a, a, an idea that they are much improved, but this is the type of point you got to hold if you're going to be a playoff team. Exactly, exactly. And to your point, Tim has talked about how bullish he is about this offense this year, in large part because of, you, because of the veteran leadership you see on the line, Pat Trywise, Victor Lula, and then obviously bringing in a guy like Kai Marcus, who is so dynamic. We've talked about this. He's probably the most dynamic handler the Radicals have ever had. So I understand why Tim is so bullish, but to your point, until you prove it on the field, practice isn't just enough. One of these points that I, this is one of these points that I want to see the calm, steadying presence of Brian Hart just kind of march things in up the field. Sure, Kai can be a threat with the disc, but we see a roller pull to set up a, a challenging trap here on the sideline. 9.14 p.m. Central Time, we are back to action. In a one goal game, the Super Series featuring the Radicals and the Windchill. Evan Lepler with Ian Toner and Colin Camp, our entire crew that has had a crazy day as well, getting set up despite all the thunderstorms. And a bobble and a drop. Victor Luo, plagued by the wet disc. Break chance, Minnesota. Mattis, gloves on both hands, making the catch underneath. Nifty, lefty. Lacey continues. 18-year-old rookie Thomas Shope resets. And now Mattis throws it away. Gutowski adds to his impressive stat. Evening with a block. It is misting ever so slightly. Certainly nothing like the downpour earlier. Tough edge on that throw, and Marcus connects with Nelson. And there's another piece that we haven't really talked about yet tonight, but last year, Jack Nelson, there was high expectations for him on the O-line for the Madison Radicals to step into a role of the goal scorer as well. Unfortunately, his season was plagued with injuries, but that's another piece that they're looking forward to this year, having back on the field. And you can see it right there. He's an impactful cutter deep for this Madison Radicals team. Yeah, you got to take someone with that size seriously in the deep space. And I don't know. I, I got the sense that that throw didn't have quite the height or perfect shape that Kai Marcus wanted uh, when you look back at the trajectory from the point of release. But fortunately, just enough juice for it to get to the end zone. First point of the night for Matt Rader. And he collides with the Madison defender, Sterling Kanaki downfield, and catches the under moments later. Quick flip to Klain. Extra help defender was there, denied the power position, Huck. I mean, Madison loves setting those opportunistic double teams, perhaps letting one of the other cutters who's on a weak side position downfield just stay unguarded and see if they can frustrate the thrower with a narrow lane and guard there, block up their vision. It was a contact call against Kanaki as Klain launches deep to the end zone, ripped down for the Minnesota score, Greg Cousins. And a phenomenal play there by Greg Cousins, going up high and pointing that with Luke Marks coming down on his back side in pursuit. Throughout the rest of this game, we're going to see the need to make those types of plays. There's going to be a wet disc, wet field condition. So two hands are going to be key in attacking that disc early and at the high point. Back-to-back -back flicks from Marcus and Klain, kind of underthrown. It's interesting because Josh is very intentional about wearing gloves, sometimes even when it's particularly dry out. And I'm not saying that gloves completely eliminate any slippage on your grip, but he's someone who I think he understands how well calibrated or poorly calibrated he is before he steps onto the field. Trywise and Luo in the backfield. Here's Ted Shuey. Oh, 
Wardick back to Shuey. First touch of the point for Marcus, who began downfield. Closing in on two minutes to play in the first half. Again, there'll be a short in halftime because of the hour and a half delay we had midway through the second quarter. An important result hanging in the balance tonight for sure. Madison trying to get to 3-0. Travel called. Minnesota expected to be 3-0 after last week's game against Pittsburgh, but a surprising one-goal loss. The wind chill enter this evening 2-1, and, and a very difficult schedule ahead for the wind chill. They go to Indy. They have home games against Colorado and New York. Not to mention another trip to Madison later this year. This is a hospital pass hanging in the end zone, deflected away by the Minnesota defender, Brian Vinoka. Bevon slides for the snag underneath. Important to note, Minnesota out of timeouts here with this break chance and just over a minute remaining until oh, halftime. Contact, though, does slow things up. Clock would have stopped with a minute to go, but now it keeps on rolling under a minute. Vanoka hits to Clerk. Big chunk gainer to Vandy Mortel. Barkus, nice angle on that inside break. Lacey resets. Around for Tristan Vandy Mortel. And into the end zone. It's Brett Bergmeier. Smooth stuff from the wind chill D line. Taking it the length of the field after the Radicals turn. And that's the type of offense we're used to seeing from this Minnesota wind chill team when they do produce these turnovers. Able to walk it up the field, punch it in, take advantage of the mistakes, go up by two with a chance to be up at, up at half. When at the end of the first quarter, things were looking quite grim for them. And, and we talked about this right before the rain delay, right? Earlier in the game, this D-line offensive unit was not doing a good job of using the width of the field. They were falling susceptible to Madison's traps and double teams, and that possession, moving the disc horizontally, changing that point of attack constantly, and not giving in to the fatigue and getting that tunnel vision in the narrow space. Final 30 seconds. End of the first quarter was a disaster for the Radicals. The worst case scenario right now for Madison has to be being down just two. You can't turn it over and let Minnesota take another shot. Of course, you'd love to get back within one. Dangerous throw to the middle, five seconds. Josh Wilson blades it to the end zone. It's smacked away by Brandon Mattis at the buzzer. Did the disc roll out of bounds with a second or so left? Did not look like it. It appears that that's gonna do it for the second quarter. You know, it's funny, Mattis is someone who normally gets those fundamental shutdown D moments, but he just elevated for the highlight real play when the disc was in the area on that sequence. Well, Free Friday Frisbee continues from Madison, Wisconsin. At the end of the second quarter, Minnesota with a 10-8 lead and abbreviated halftime with about 100 seconds left as we welcome you back into our broadcast booth where it is dry once again with Colin Camp and Ian Toner. I'm Evan Lepler. I really think the story of the first half was Minnesota's D-line converting breaks in that second quarter. They got a little momentum, and they just kept on the pressure against the Radical O. Exactly. Minnesota found their footing in this game finally. And, and for me, too, it's it's been a game of runs, and Minnesota's really taken advantage of that kind of back and forth to this point and they're really utilizing their championship DNA and what they're they're built on at this point which is defense and let's 
my mind state the obvious too. They're making the clutch plays. Exactly. They're winning the end of quarter 50-50 balls in points that hang in the balance that could be two or three goal swings in either direction. They're actually finishing those off. They're converting breaks in a way that they weren't in the first quarter. This is a group that's just starting to simply put make plays. Well, the difference in the game right now is literally the two end of quarter goals. Vanoka scored the buzzer and then Bergmeier's break with 29 seconds left combined with a Mattis block. Those two goals, the reason Minnesota's got 10 and Madison's got two fewer. 10-8, third quarter will begin with the Radicals on offense. If they had converted at the buzzer at the end of the second, then they'd be in position to tie it up here. Right now, they're just trying to slice the gap in half. And Evan, we talked about earlier some of these offensive points that we really want Madison to prove that they have that offensive line this year that they've desperately been needing, and this is one of those points right now. Excellent pull from the Minnesota D-line, and Madison's got a long way to go. Brian Hart and Victor Luo finally get it out of the end zone to Kai Marcus. We know he can shoot it to the other end zone from there. Underneath, Bergmeier goes flying past Shuey. Here in Robert, I'll make it Gabe Vordick in the end zone for Madison. Well, this is Kai Marcus in some of his purest form as we get a look at the boys just having a moment there. Guy Marcus getting the disc in flow. I don't know about you, Colin. I remember running that drill when I was learning how to play ultimate. The dishy huck. Catch the underneath. Dish it over to the person in power position. They unleash the deep shot in flow. And that is exactly how it's supposed to play out in a real point. Yeah, that was that was ultimate 101 in a lot of ways and, and working the break side utilizing a backhand hook in this type of weather as well where it's a little bit more stable to throw some of those backhands resulting in a, a really easy goal. Radicals back within one. Has been a while since we've seen Madison's D-line record a break. They did get one midway through the second quarter, but when I say it's been a while, it's been like almost two hours. With the hour and a half delay mixed in. This is Snyder, back to Raider. Active Mark from Luke Marks. And now he sets a double team on Vanoka, who blades it back for Raider. Plain. And Minnesota's calling a pick if the officials were going to miss it. Madison was screaming for it in the middle of the field. Leo Savelle Fernandez made the call on himself. Classy move by the UFA rookie. Here's Gordon Larson. It's Raider under. Bivon. A handful of shimmies, and then released to Michael Jordan. Double teamed. Gets the hammer over the outstretched arm of Meshnik with the cross field shot. Falls to the ground off the fingertips of Savell Fernandez. It's exactly the kind of throw that that double team wants to force. A cross field hammer that hangs just enough for the defenders to pressure, and Kelson Alexander in the area on that one. Sterling Kanaki. Shia midfield, resets. Mitchell McCarthy floats it long and off Kanaki's hand. He wants a foul. He's going to get one. Quinn Snyder saying that he thought it was clean, but the official on the trail side is going to give Madison the disc on the goal line. Kanaki and Snyder still barking at one another. But Sterling's got the disc centered. 
with an opportunity to punch this in and tie this game. McCarthy to Kanaki. Hammer, end zone, Meshnick got it. We are tied again here at Bree Stevens Field. And we see here that the crowd has still stuck around. They're starting to get loud. And the Radicals are debuting their break horn today. So they're trying to produce some of this energy to, to liven up the crowd and get everybody back into it. And what a perfect way to start the second half in order to do that. Certainly a lot of contact. First goal of the day for Andrew Meshnick. 167th career goal. One of the longtime stars in this league. Here's one more look at the foul call on the shot from McCarthy. That's close. A lot of contact, but it's it's hard to know if Sterling maybe initiated that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think there's an interpretation of that angle where perhaps you say Snyder's shoulder went into Kanaki's side, but some of that is also just guys jockeying for position that is part of the sport. Exactly. Double team right in front of the Radicals bench. Hammer back to Barry. Low throw, hits the turf. Oh my De goodness. DeClerc tries to sell it, but the officials now screaming that it's down. Certainly looked down as DeClerc made the catch. Now the officiating crew coming together. Hard to tell from that. Now they're gonna call it up. Steve Haynes has the white hat on and he signaled up. Minnesota will retain possession. Vanny Mortel almost had a disc don't lie moment where he overshot the throw, but a nice grab by KJ. And then pass the bid from Madison's number nine, Josh Wilson. Barkus, blading throw, caught for the score. And Barry, who looked like he had turned it over, has the go-ahead goal with 7.37 left in the third. Make sense of that for me, gentlemen. I, we've only seen two angles from a little bit further away. I think from my recollection of seeing it live up here in the booth and squinting at those two replays, I, I'm still convinced that that disc was down. I thought so as well, but I did find it interesting that the, the official that made that call was actually the, the referee about 50 yards away from the play was, was making that call as well. So I guess maybe if you have that closer perspective, it looks up, but to me from this angle, right in the broadcast booth, I also thought it was down. Okay. Remember that sequence. But this final score line is it all close. Lots of opportunities over the next 19 plus minutes of game action for Madison to earn it back in their favor. Frywise back to Hart. Bordix going, just eluding his outstretched reach. I don't think he expected that throw to go up. If you see him coming out of his break there, he's actually still jogging. Brian Hart unleashes an absolute missile, and unfortunately, Vordek is not able to catch up to it. Vinoka shy of midfield to Bergmeier. And that's right on the money. Matije Petrovic from the Czech Republic 
hauls in the break to put the windshield back up too. I mean, you contrast the two throws to the end zone between these two teams. Brian Hart trying to connect with his receiver, perhaps a little too sharp, a little too crisp, and his receiver perhaps not quite ready for it. At the other end of the spectrum, you take a look at this shot, and it's just perfectly on the money, clap catching right in front of his face. Yeah, and to your point, contrasting those two throws, it almost felt like that throw from Hart was a little bit forced even. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the throw from the windshield was a little bit more in flow. And, and so you see the end result there too. And, you know, I think that's a big factor in that as well. D-line personnel out here for this offensive point for Madison. Absolutely, after the break. Big Jacob Wom towering over his mark, Cameron Lacey. And Lacey switches. And there's a layout block in the middle of the field. Matije Petrovic. After scoring the goal, last possession gets the block, but then unable to maintain possession there. Wilson scubers for Wom. Unmarked for a moment. Now DeClerc picks him up. Nobody's open. And a difficult reset. Forcing Wilson to leave his feet. He ticked towards five minutes to play in the third. And again, I'm a bit surprised that Coach DeBiles not using a timeout here. The, the offense has stagnated a little bit, but now we're seeing them work it into that red zone. Well, it's a Dylan DeClerc layout on the goal line, Colin. And another break opportunity for Minnesota. Almost a Callahan from Wom, And it's a timeout for the wind chill. As Ben Feldman and his coaching staff will stop the play. An opportunity for Minnesota to extend their lead to three for the first time tonight. So that, that, that's twice that you guys have articulated for a timeout call. And I'll be honest, both times you, you mentioned it. In, in my mind at the end of the first quarter, I thought, well, Kelson Alexander just needs to shoot this to the end zone. They don't need to waste the time out here. But you were right. He wasn't ready for that situation. And this is the same thing. There were no turns on that point. You know, Madison's D-line was out there, but they were working it. But again, you were right because you sensed something that things were just out of sorts. Yeah, this point feels too critical to, to not execute it and, and score it, right? You have your, your prime line, as they call it, which is mainly defenders out there trying to score on offense. And you took the early momentum in this half, got it back to a tie game, quickly gave up two goals after that. This point is too critical, and the offense was too stagnant there for me to, to be comfortable. Right off the bat, Klain shooting it for Raider, and he rips it down over Gutowski. Still about 25 yards of work to do. Raider floats it for Quinn Snyder. A saucy high release throw from Matt Raider. And the windchill have their largest lead of the night. I mean, if that isn't quintessential Matt Raider, I don't know what is. Josh Clean having no fear hucking from a standstill because he knows Matt Raider is on the other end of this one. And he puts someone on a poster, Gutowski no less, and just that casual, he's thrown that step through high release backhand, I, I don't know how many hundreds of times in his career at this point. He just makes it look so effortless. And he, he brings that level of confidence and swagger to that group and just instills it to his line mates when he executes in that way. 
spent parts of six seasons in the UFA. Tonight's only his 32nd career game. And we think of him as a, as a you know, veteran maybe on the tail end, but he's just 32, turning 33 this summer. He's got so many miles on him because he was playing at such a high level at such a young age. He was 16 playing at you know, the national championships. Started playing as a sixth grader in Seattle. And what a day he's had, you think, from being grounded in the St. Louis airport to now making that type of play late at night. Mattis collides with Shrywise. You can see the frustration there in Shrywise's body language. These two guys have had a lot of battles, and then the stoppage perhaps contributes to the turnover as Vanny Mortel gets the easy run through block on Marcus. This is snowballing quick. Vanny Mortel shoots it, and Bergmeier can't make the play with a little help defense from Gutowski. I mean, that's great recognition from Gutowski, just peeling Gutowski off the back of the stack. Would have been easy to just watch that thing go up and say your prayers and hope for the best, but no quitting that kid right now. now could have made it a four goal game as Mattis gets another one on Shrywise. Pat's looking for a call and none is coming. That was another one of those ones that just kind of felt like Guy's body. And there's the break. And again, we're seeing this Minnesota D-line step up. They've been doing that since basically the end of the first quarter. They have played largely a flawless game through the second quarter and into the third quarter now. Led by their veterans, guys like Dylan DeClerc coming up big, making plays, Brandon Mattis as well. Couple blocks now for Mattis and to Clerk. It's like his fuel tank is constantly full. That guy never runs out of energy. And if he has six gears, he finds a seventh one when he's here in Madison. I, I swear playing in front of a big crowd gets that guy fired up more than just about anyone I've ever seen. Today the 90th game of DeClerc's UFA career. And he scored his 150th career goal here tonight. That was hand blocked on the mark and it finds the turf across the sideline. Gordon Larson gets the block. I mean, those are the challenges that arise when you have to get into a situation where you keep reaching deeper and deeper into your depth chart and ask that defensive unit to play offense again and again. And how about the coaching move from Ben Feldman putting Danny Mortel on the D-line tonight? It has paid off. Vinoka fouled. And he will center and get a fresh stall count. An opportunity to make it a five-goal game under two minutes left in the third. Barkas swings it. Madison has had a knack for slowing teams down with their zone defense near the goal line. But Minnesota patient and poised. Another great possession there by Minnesota, working it through the defense, around the defense, ultimately connecting for the goal there. And boy, things turned quickly. It was just a few minutes ago, we were at 10, 10 to 10. However, we've highlighted throughout this entire telecast, this is a game of runs, especially with these two teams. Binoka leading the pack now, three goals tonight to go along with over 300 yards of total offense. Still hasn't turned the ball over in 2024. Turning in some of his best ultimate of his career in the early stages of this campaign. So it was a 10-all game, as Colin mentioned, not all that long ago. And now it feels like the wind chill are in control. Minnesota will receive to start the fourth. Ty Marcus wants it all, and he wants it quickly. 
Bodies piling up shy of the end zone, and it is caught off the deflection by Ted Shuey. I'm not sure how this is how the Radicals drew that possession up, but Gabe Vordick with an emphatic spike as the crowd erupts here at Breeze. I mean, Kai wound up and pumped once. The mark came over and closed down the traditional backhand window, and then he said, screw it. I'm going to pull the trigger on an inside-out backhand, but that thing hung up there like a moon ball. Exactly, and this is one of those moments where you almost wish we had a simulcast of, like, coach cams, right? Because, <laughs> boy, I would have loved to see Tim DeBile's expression. We talked about earlier how Kai Marcus has probably the greenest light any Radicals <laughs> thrower has ever had. That's right. I'm not so sure it's as green anymore. Oh, boy. Marcus did get the assist. There's Tim. So Minnesota, if you're Ben Feldman, you just don't want to give the Radicals a chance here. You want to maintain a four-goal lead at the minimum going into the fourth. Slow start tonight for the Minnesota O-line, but they found their groove as this evening has progressed. Matt Raiders' return after the stoppage has only given them a boost. 10 seconds, cross field hammer into traffic. Smacked down by Madison's Kelson Alexander. And then he throws it into the turf, but time will run out. There is no foul call, and we are headed to the fourth in a four-goal game. So that's the third straight quarter that the Radicals have a chance with time expiring. They, they do get the final goal of the quarter technically. Minnesota will have the disc to start the fourth. 12 minutes left here on a Friday night in the capital city of Ultimate. And welcome back. We are revisiting the end of the third quarter here. Under 10 seconds left, the Madison Radicals produce a turnover. We're all up here questioning why not call a timeout in this situation. You're down by four. You have an opportunity about six or seven seconds left on the clock. It's another opportunity missed in a game that is critical, low scoring. We're wondering why we're holding on to timeouts at this point. Again, it's easy to play Monday or Monday morning quarterback. However, you got to question some of the decision making made by Tim DeVille tonight. Would you, as an offensive player, be standing on the sideline as a player, being like, "Coach, call it so we can get me back out there"? I'm the wrong person to be asking that because I was in Tim DeVille's ear at all times. So <laughs> sounds like you're Absolutely. the right. Sounds like you're the right person to be asking. <laughs> But that's because I knew I was going to get back on the field and be able to play. So maybe there was a little bit of bias in, in some of my decision making. Well, no, I. to your point, just what are you saving it for if you're not using it there? You, you got this four-goal deficit. You have an opportunity to try and give yourself a chance to chip away at it. And you wonder if maybe part of that decision tonight is knowing that you don't have guys like Max Sample. He's a key contributor yeah. to the end of the quarter. 6'8", huge target down there. Maybe that's a factor in all those decisions. Floater, but Larson there to pull it down. And it's back to a five-goal game again. Add another one to Snyder's ledger for the night. And I've been really impressed with Quinn Snyder tonight. Obviously, we outlined his de in detail his day-to-day. -day. <laughs> and it does really talk to his preparation and his mentality that he can come in after a day that is extremely stressful Matt Raider as well and and come out here and absolutely ball out he's been a big factor in this game for Minnesota he's going to, to continue to be a big factor for them all year but it's really impressive to see what he's doing tonight how about that shot from Greg Cousins as well I mean you talk about Snyder having a tough day I mean, I guess Greg Cousins is more well-rested because he hadn't played the league in the last five seasons. His last year before this season was 2018, and he was thought of as a goal scorer back then. I mean, he was third in the league in goals back in 2017. That was a nice...
confident shot to Snyder to stretch the lead back to five, matching the largest lead of the night for Minnesota. Oh boy, thought we were gearing up for another turnover there. Foul called on Bergmeier. Ian Luo seemed to be on good terms. Marcus ripping another backhand. That's going to get right in Shuey's bread basket. Where was the defense on Shuey there? Trywise resets for Luo, and Pat is in. I don't think the defense thought there was going to be a heat seeking missile six feet off the ground, just 60 yards down the middle of the field. Not the most traditional flight path, but hey, Kai Marcus has the vision, and he had the execution on that point. Touche. Yeah. It's a good point by you. There's not a lot of ways you could defend a throw like that. Yeah. I, it just so happened that there was just enough spacing throughout the rest of the field for that flight path to work out, and Marcus knew it was time to pull the trigger on that one. Shout out to these Radicals fans, by the way. There's still hundreds of people here you know, awaiting the return of this game. Goes in and on 10 o'clock local time. Enjoying the evening here in Madison. Never been a part of a crowd in ultimate like the 2016 championship weekend here, calling a game you were playing in against Matt Rader and the Seattle Cascades. Sorry to bring it up, but aside from the result for the Radicals, it was one of the nights in ultimate that I will absolutely never forget, a game changer for this league, truly. Absolutely, and, and for me as well. I mean, it's one of those things where obviously the end result is not what I would have personally wanted, what the fans would have wanted, but it does go down as one of those memories that are forever ingrained in your mind of this is what ultimate could be, and this is what, it, what ultimate should be. And it was really one of the true pinnacles of, of my career to be able to play in a game like that. Marks gives way to leap forth. Three goal game. And don't look now, but we've mentioned this before and we'll mention it again. With these two teams, a game is never over until there are three zeros on that timer. <laughs> and I love the play after the turnover here. Marks gets the block, the deep shot goes up, and Liebforth and Marks chasing it down. Mark's doing a very great but subtle job of just maintaining his position. There's nothing illegal about it. He's not sticking his arm out and arm barring, but by having that second body in the space holding ground, it just relieves the pressure on Liebforth. And we saw other instances around the league earlier this year where, hey, maybe defenses were sending two defenders to an area when there was only one receiver. And they were able to capitalize on it Madison, in this instance, sending two offensive receivers to that space, and things working out. Is that disc down? Sideline official says an incomplete pass. Vandy Mortel can't believe it. Chance for Madison to get back within two. And just like that, we still got nine minutes to play. It's a two-goal game. Curious to see that replay. The Minnesota sideline has erupted with a fury saying that was not an incomplete pass, that it was kept alive. Oh, yeah. I, you can see the... Yeah, it looks like it bounces. Yeah, you can see the bounce. Definitely a turnover there. I... That's, that's the tough thing for me to understand is how you can be so incredulous when there's proof that the disc bounced. Gentlemen, that's three goals for the Radicals in the last minute and 25 seconds. Before that, they had not scored but one goal in the previous eight and a half minutes. 
Well, and this is a little reminiscent of the end of the game between Minnesota and Chicago. Minnesota had a strong lead, a comfortable lead, and they started letting Chicago kind of creep back into it. So now you got your vets back out here. Taking another shot to Snyder, and that's a beautiful put from Bivon. I mean, the man can't miss tonight. He is he is in flow state, okay? That's, that's pretty much the best way to describe the way he's playing. Minnesota's getting other contributions around the roster, but... He's climbing the ladder at end of quarter situations. He's sending his receivers to the end zone with touch. He's possessing and valuing the disc. I mean, goodness. Well, yeah, and it's really impressive because he is an all-league level player, and it seems like he's stepped his game up to even another level this year. Yeah. He's just so consistent, so poised out there, and he hasn't slowed down one bit. Meanwhile, Snyder's having a nice night, too. Four goals, over 200 receiving yards. Back to a three-goal game with eight and a half to play. Marcus going to take another shot off the bat. And that just a little too far for Luo. So that's one of those throws. And, and Colin, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're f you're more familiar with the differences between the previous disc and the new professional Ultimate Frisbee. That disc held its edge and didn't flatten out or stabilize the way the previous disc would have. Exactly. Yeah, that's that is definitely a product of the new disc, from my understanding of the dynamics of that disc. And traditionally, you would see a, a you know the previous discraft disc kind of level off there potentially and give Luo more of a chance to run under it. Stall count was rising on the 18-year-old Shope, so Feldman uses his final timeout trying to put this game away. His team had a five-goal lead not too long ago, then a quick 3-0 run from the Radicals brought it back within two. Minnesota chance to get the advantage back to four. Madison loses tonight. And another undefeated team will fall. Just during this weekend, you had Carolina and Austin both 2-0. Madison at 2-0 and Salt Lake at 5-0. Hey, stay safe and stay radical. It's possible if Chicago could beat Austin tomorrow, then we'd have just two undefeated teams in the league heading into week six. And I think for the fans in the league, that's the type of parity that they've been looking for. Obviously, it's cool. It's fun to see dynasties at times with New York. Yeah, but we're tired of the New York Empire race. Exactly, exactly. People grow tired of it, and to see that level of parity is, is really good for the league, I think. Well, there's no question the Empire's level has dropped a little bit to start the season, but I also think you know Salt Lake entered the offseason knowing that they needed to raise their level, and they've done that. Minnesota knew, knows they need to do that as well. And they add a guy like Matt Rader. That's part of the reason why. 18-14 wind chill as they look to win for the fourth time in five tries here at Bree Stevens Field. which is crazy to say, because there was a time when Madison went a half decade without losing here at Bree Stevens Field. You guys would just show up, and take care of business, night in, night out, week in, week out. Yeah, I, you know, and obviously I think this, this Radicals team is fighting a few demons right now of years past. Um, these are good learning moments for them, right? I think it's a good humbling experience for them as well. I obviously understand why they were riding high after those first two games. But kind of taking a gut punch from Minnesota when coming out so strong is, is a good testing moment for your team and, and how you'll respond. Is it going to push you to, to get better or is it going to start a, a, a bit of a cycle that you know ultimately results in the ending that you're not looking for? Gutowski for Vordick. Back to Marcus. It's amazing how the energy in the stadium has shifted after the conversion of that break. What felt like a lively crowd has started to lose its luster a little. Not the edge that Marcus wanted on that throw.
Vandy Mortel will pick up. He's got company with Lacey in the backfield. Lacey charges downfield. He's open, and the hammer from Vandy Mortel into the crowd, and it went right through Lacey's hands. Amazed that hammer got to Cameron Lacey. Yeah, and this game's definitely loosened up a little bit. Um, earlier on, we were seeing much tighter possessions, many throws working up the field, working both sides of the field. We're seeing the game loosen up a little bit. Obviously, at this point, I think that benefits Minnesota. Uh, however, Minnesota needs to be careful to not allow Madison back in the game by loosening up their offense. So when you're a part of that offense that's been getting, getting a little loose, as you say, how do you rein things back in yeah i mean it's it's the old cliche and ultimate is, is winning with your legs right it's it's who's going to be the guy stepping up to just go get the disc marcus for gutowski and a frustration smack of the disc after the score as much as it feels like minnesota's in control it is just still a three-point game with five and a half minutes to play Well, it's almost like Gutowski heard you up here in the booth because he was the one churning downfield. He's doing what he can to spark some life into not only his teammates but this crowd and get the energy back in the venue. Radicals defense know they need a turn and a break and they can't waste too much time doing it. Lane hits Barry under to midfield for Larson. Meshnick came with a double team, but the reset finds Klain. That's a floater. Could be trouble, but it's snagged by Barry. And he rips it. May have overthrown it, but it hits the sliding Raider. With Kanaki nearby, Raider has another score for the windchill. And boy, are they happy that he was able to make it tonight. I'm not entirely sure that throw was intended for Raider there. I'm with you, Colin. I am 100% with you. Fantastic grab there by Raider. Good sportsmanship between Raider and Kanaki, who were very physical when that Raider first entered the game. First point was with about five minutes to go in the second quarter. But he has made his presence felt. Four goal game with five minutes to play. Winchill are off next weekend, but then they go to Indy on June 8th. It's their only game of the year against the Alley Cats. So you think about that for potential tiebreaker purposes. If they have the same record, that, that game is the decider without a rematch in the regular season. And as Ben Feldman said to me before the season, playing indoors, I know it's going to be a close game. Weird stuff's going to happen. That's a really critical game for us. Brian Hart throws it to Dylan DeClerc. Dylan has worked hard for a lot of these. That one was a gift. Benny Mortel finds Vanoka. Johnson. Benny Mortel. Kristen Benny Mortel is a college national champion with the University of Minnesota on a stormy weekend in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it's bookends for DeClerc. An awkward landing. Colliding with Gutowski, but he's all right. And so or the wind chill. And you were right to point this out earlier, Evan. The decision to deploy Vandy Mortel on the D-line and his impact on that group's ability to convert after the turnover cannot go unnoticed. Seems like a really smart coaching decision. The five-goal lead and just over four minutes left to go here in this huge interdivisional, I'm sorry, Super Series intra-divisional matchup and toner i think that's a really great point that you're making there because one of my 
key things that I saw about this matchup was that Sam Berglund was not going to be playing tonight. And he is such a key cog to the offense for that defensive line of Minnesota. So to bring in Vandy Mortel, and he has really settled them down when they're getting the disc on the turn. And he has made a, a massive impact tonight for their defensive line. Minnesota just throws a little junk, trying to help lead some more time from the clock with a five-goal lead, under four minutes to play. A reminder, the UFA game of the week. Yikes. Matija Petrovic immediately apologizing to Mitchell McCarthy. Clear foul, 10 yards. They mark it off and play on. Game of the week tomorrow night from Austin, Texas. The Chicago Union, representing the Central Division, take on the Austin Soul. And we're currently about to be one of the three remaining undefeated teams in the league. You can see that game and every UFA game on WatchUFA.tv. Every game all season long available for just $11.99 a month. That's every game in UFA history. Radicals back within four, but Precious Time disappeared on that possession. Now just 2.42 to play. Here's a look at the best of the UFA upcoming schedule. Chicago and Austin, 8 o'clock Eastern tomorrow, and then the Austin Soul will take on the Carolina Flyers. And it could be a battle between two of the final three remaining undefeated teams in the league next Friday night. Next Friday night, Ian. It's going to be an unbelievable evening because you and I are going to be in Colorado for the hustle and the summit. Also next Friday, you have Boston at New York and Chicago against Madison. I'd call that Frisbee's equivalent of must-see TV. It's going to be an incredible Friday night. The pre-Friday Frisbee will be the Super Series game between the hustle and the summit. Everything else can be seen on WatchUFA.tv. Johnson sends this one deep, and Quinn Snyder again controlling the skies. Remember his skyscraping snag of Andrew Meshnick earlier in the night was a huge tone center as Jake Carrico goes horizontal for the block there. Ticking toward two minutes to go. Meshnick. Minnesota is trying to prevent Madison from scoring immediately. A pretty nice job of transition defense from the wind chill after the giveaway. And now we get the timeout with a buck 49 to play. And the Radicals down four. Yeah, and really in these situations, I mean, obviously I, I understand why Coach Zabal is making this timeout call. You kind of have to throw some of those 50-50 balls that, that Kai Marcus has put up at times in these situations. Four points in a minute 49. That is a, a tall mountain to climb. So I, I anticipate that they are going to be trying to set up something here where they score in one to two passes because they can't have any more of this precious time come off the clock. And then obviously from there, probably some sort of roller pull, putting them onto the sideline if they are able to score so that they can try to produce a quick turnover. Wonder if they're going to try and isolate Gutowski in space here. Coming out of the timeout, you saw Kai Marcus motioning to him in a kind of horizontal movement as they were in that huddle. And Gutowski, one of the few cutters at the back of this diagonal stack. Kai Marcus. To the middle of the field for Vordick. Back to Marcus, near the pylon, and Gutowski taps the foot in the end zone for the score. The Radicals break makes it 20 to 17 with 135 remaining. Fascinating little nugget. Hank Carey, the sideline official there, who pointed to the head official to confirm the goal call. You'll see him here, he was out of your frame. He's in your frame. You see him looking at the feet, and then he points over at the head official. 
he was talking to me about the official's warm-up protocol. Just like players are warming up, yeah, of course, they got to do their butt kicks and high knees and get the legs loose. But as the players are going through their warm-up drills and trying to complete passes to each other, they'll play this game called left foot, right foot. And they'll try and pinpoint, hey, when that receiver made possession, was their first point of contact the left foot or the right foot? <laughs> and it's trying to get them used to having to make that split-second judgment at game speed. And you can see that he was ready for that moment there. You can play that game at home the next time you're watching <laughs> on your TV or in the stands at a UFA game. Leo Savell Fernandez, as we tick under a minute to play. It's harder than you think. I was hanging out with him for 30 seconds down there at field level without the benefit of our perfect broadcast perch and instant replay. Open my eyes to some of the challenges they have. And certainly a very difficult job to be an official, and we've got some of the best in the league here tonight. That ricochets off the hands of Greg Cousins, and Tim DeBile takes his final timeout with 27 seconds left, and the body language of my comrades here in the booth suggests you feel this timeout should have been called much earlier than now. I don't want to dog on Tim too hard. I, you know, it's it's easy for us to snicker at this, given how the second half of this game has unfolded. But I, I think we agree there are certainly opportunities, end of the third quarter and elsewhere, where a timeout trigger could have been pulled. Yeah, I mean it's a three goal game right now, and, and I think we've expressed at least two if not three times where we thought there could have been timeouts called that would have had a, a potential high impact on this game by two or three points so while we're kind of snickering and joking about it now because the you know the game is kind of decided there are a bit of a butterfly effect to some of those lack of decisions that well that's a question for the post game press conference right you know maybe tim had some reasoning Marcus sending this one. It's Gutowski versus Barry and DeClerc. And DeClerc used his body and gave up the D for Barry. And that should just about do it. Disappointing week four loss to Pittsburgh for the Minnesota windshield, but they're going to bounce back with a road win against the Madison Radicals. 20 to 17 was the score before that throw. Dylan DeClerc with a buzzer beater to give us a final of 21-17. A Minnesota minus three and a half ticket. Cha-ching. Maybe that goal mattered for somebody. So the Radicals fall from the ranks of the unbeaten. And the wind chill sit at three and one back on top of the Central Division. They got a week off before they head to Indy and then they host Colorado on June 15th, as you see the updated standing, Chicago a winner earlier tonight as well. In Houston, the Union prevailed 20 to 14. Chicago is at Austin tomorrow. Pittsburgh could get to three and two tomorrow. They play at Toronto on the second day of a back-to-back. -back. Detroit has now lost 78 straight games. What impressed you guys most about what we saw from the windshield here tonight? Yeah, I mean, if you're Coach Feldman, you got to be ecstatic. The, the fact that you bounce back from such a difficult loss last week, come into a very difficult place to play under extreme conditions with the weather and, and really a you mental test for everybody, to have that resilience to bond together through injuries and players missing and, and travel delays, you got to think that your team's back on the right track of where you're trying to lead them to this year. Yeah, I'd say the combination of players filling needed roles, perhaps playing slightly outside their comfort zones, not necessarily being deployed in the exact same way that they had in previous seasons or earlier this season, and still being comfortable enough to win a challenging divisional matchup on the road, I'm just so impressed with the coaching decisions that went into that, 
with the player's ability to adjust. And I think that speaks to what you've said, Colin, this group's resilience, its character, its development. I know we're early here in the season. I know Madison's still going to have something to say later in the season. I know they're going to have all kinds of other challengers in the Central, but you can see it right there. They earned this celebration right here. Minnesota Windchill win at Bree Stevens Field again. They're going to dance into the night. Antje Petrovic having a moment inside the circle. And now Ben Feldman done a little dance. 21-17 is the final tonight. Thanks for being with us through the lightning delay and oh so much more. For Ian Toner and Colin Camp and our whole crew, I'm Evan Lepler saying goodnight from Madison.